Morning, church. Um, I have a little joke for you. Roxanne reminded me of it with her turkey centipede. So Pastor Dale's driving down a gravel road and he gets passed by a three-legged turkey, which in itself is kind of a joke because Pastor doesn't let anybody pass. <laughs> so anyway, this three-legged turkey's running down the road. Pastor decides he's going to follow it. So he follows this three-legged turkey up to the farmer's house, or up to a, a farm. Farmer comes out and says, can I help you with something? Pastor says to him, he goes, what's the deal with that three-legged turkey? And the farmer says, well, you know, if Ma wants a drumstick, she can have a drumstick. If I want a drumstick, I can have a drumstick. And if Brother Don comes over and he wants a drumstick, he can have a drumstick. He goes, oh, well, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. So how do they taste? He goes, we don't know. We've never caught one. <laughs> That's my little Thanksgiving joke. <laughs> okay, so one of the things that we've been talking about in, in youth group is the Ten Commandments. And last week we talked about the Seventh Commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, after Wednesday I was watching this preacher talking and he was he was speaking about killing sin in our lives. And he brought up these verses here, and um, I just want to share this with you. I better get my eyes out first. Okay. This is from Matthew 5, and it's 27 through 30. Okay. So it says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if the right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Okay, now, when I was listening to this preacher talk about these verses, um, he, he explained that Jesus wasn't being literal here. He doesn't mean pluck your eye out and cut your hand off. But what he was saying is that you need to, be, you need to take sin very seriously, that it's not something to play around with, and that you need to sometimes take extreme measures to avoid it. And while he was saying this, I was reminded of the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. When Joseph was put in a situation of where he could have sinned, he ran. He literally ran. He left his coat behind. And uh, sometimes that's what we got to do. You know, even, even something as, as common as, as gossip, when somebody wants to gossip, we need to acknowledge that that is a sin. And we, we need to stop it right there. We need to say, nope, I'm not going to be a part of it. You know, and sometimes... Uh, probably shouldn't say this, but I was sharing this with my wife, and she goes, so if I want another piece of cake or a donut, I should run from it? <laughs> and I'm like, yes, run. <laughs> For me, that's the only way to get away from the cake and donut, is I gotta run. So, anyway, um, serious, this, like, like I was saying, sin is a very serious thing. It will keep you out of heaven, and it also keeps us from God. You know, if you're living an unrighteous, unholy life, um, you can't be close to the Savior. So it's a good thing he, he did what he did for us and that we can repent of those sins. Let us pray. Dear Father God, we love you and we thank you. We thank you for this day and we thank you for each one that's here. Lord, we just ask that you have your way in this service today. We pray that the message that Pastor brings will be one that we can apply to our lives, that we can share with others. Lord, we pray your blessings over the tithes and offerings that are given. And we ask that they be used to increase your kingdom. Lord, we pray for those who are sick. And we ask that for your healing. We pray for those who are struggling and going through difficulties in their lives. Lord, we pray that you will give them peace and understanding. And Lord, as we go through this day and through this week, we ask that you make us aware of situations or circumstances which might lead us into sin or temptation and help us to overcome it and to, to run from it if needed. We just thank you for being so good. We thank you for your love, your kindness, and your mercy. And it's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Good to see all of you. 
Some of you know exactly what that song is talking about when it says, let the weak say I am strong and the poor say I am rich. Because you've been without money, but you've realized how rich you are. You've lacked strength, but you've realized that with God you can do whatever you need to do. It's a gift, isn't it? And when we say thanks to God, we bring it back around to give him credit. Three men went to Aberdeen, Mississippi, dropped in at a church there, talked to the pastor. They said, there's a woman in your church who we know, uh, and we want you to uh, let us know if you become aware of her needing anything. Uh, one was in New Jersey, lived in New Jersey, one lived in Oklahoma, one lived in California. But each of them said, here's my card, you call me anytime she needs help in any way. And then they told them why. They went to the local uh, bank, to the president. They said, there's a woman in town, has an account here, I'm sure. Uh, we want to help her if she ever has financial need. Would you call one of us or all of us if you ever become aware of her having any financial difficulty and here's why. And they took care of her. Um, one of them did her taxes every year. All three of them came every year at the same time to visit. They each brought a gift that their wife had picked out. They hired someone to cut her grass, clean her gutters, trim her hedges. They arranged for maintenance to be done on her home or one of them would come and do it himself. They just wanted to take care of this woman. And here's the reason. When they were younger, they were in the military together. And one day they were standing in a house and a hand grenade came flying through the window. And this man, this woman's husband was with them and he threw himself on top of that hand grenade. He absorbed the impact and of course he died instantly. But these three young men had their whole life in front of them. And when they got done with their service, they agreed, we're going to take care of his wife, whatever it costs, whatever she needs, we're going to take care of her. It's a testimony, isn't it? They get up in the morning, feel the sunshine and say, if it weren't for Jim, I wouldn't be here. As they raise their families, if it weren't for Jim, I wouldn't be experiencing this. And so they took care of Jim's wife. It's a remarkable example. But let me tell you one other detail about that story. When that hand grenade came through the window, there were 19 soldiers in that room. Jim threw himself down and gave up his life. 18 others walked away. Three of them were grateful enough to do something about it. The other 15, I don't know. But it made all the difference in the world to that woman that three men said, we've got your back. We're taking care of you the way Jim would have. Gratitude is a huge thing, isn't it? can change our lives. In fact, the spirit of gratitude is a basic building block in any person's character. Of all the character qualities that we admire, that we, we want, that show Christ in us, down here at the base is gratitude. You can't please God if you don't have gratitude. You probably can't really be a good person, truly good, without gratitude. I'm not sure the Bible says that, but I, it seems to me that it's that important. Gratitude is something we, we build on and we need to work at in order to get good at it. It's not automatic. What's one of the first things you have to teach a little guy, a little girl? Somebody gives them something and what's mom say? What do you say? Charge it. No. <laughs> What do you say? What do you say? How many times 
Do you hear that growing up? Why? Because it's not automatic. It's something we have to learn, but it's something that can become automatic. We can learn to cultivate gratitude and we can become better at it. We can be intentional about learning it. And when we do, it transforms our lives and it benefits everybody around us. We know we ought to be thankful and we see the positive fruit that comes from it and yet it's easy to neglect it. It's easy to just kind of let it slip past. Gratitude can fade out if we let in something else that will just crowd it out of our thoughts and our minds. A person who is not thankful, what is going on inside them? Well, perhaps it's resentment. Perhaps it's a sense of entitlement that says, I, I, I should have more. Perhaps it's a critical spirit. Perhaps it's unforgiveness. Perhaps it's some other thing, but a, the, these negative qualities that, that do come naturally to us, they crowd out the sense of gratitude that God intends. And we have to be intentional about picking one and, and putting aside the other. And this is a good week to remind ourselves of that. Uh, Thanksgiving is a good time for us. The Bible teaches a lot about thankfulness. And here's one passage in the book of Colossians, just three verses in a row. And I'd like to read them to you. And I want you to notice that three times it talks about having gra gratitude, having a thankful heart. Let the peace that Christ gives control your thinking. It is for peace that you were chosen to be together in one body. And always be thankful. Let the teaching of Christ live inside you richly. Use all wisdom to teach and counsel each other. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Everything you say and everything you do should be done for Jesus, your Lord. And in all you do, give thanks to God the Father through Jesus. God is the source of every gift. Jesus is the way that we get it. And so we come back to him with gratitude because of that. Uh, I'm going to give you five ideas of how we can help ourselves develop a grateful, thankful heart. The first one, a thankful heart recognizes God in everything. You step outside on the 19th of November, and the sun is shining, and you don't really need your jacket if you're not going to be out too long, and you say, thank you, Lord, for a beautiful fall day. Uh, thank you, Lord, there's one lovely leaf still left on one tree, <laughs> okay? Whatever it is, you see God's hand, you see what he's made, and uh, the wonders of what he made, and we pay attention. You know, we have to be careful um, to notice what God is doing and to never lose our marvels. You've heard of people losing their marbles. That's a very unfortunate thing. I can tell you by experience. But there's even another way that's tragic and that is when you lose your marvels, when you're not amazed anymore, when you don't have a sense of wonder anymore, when you just kind of get a, a gray look at a beautiful world because God wants us to notice that he's in things, to notice what he's made and to respond to it. Make room for amazement in your life. Keep learning what an awesome place this world is, what awesome people surround us. The plant and animal kingdoms are just an endless supply of wow, really. You notice in them how God pays attention to the details. See, little details, you think, God, how did you think of that? And not only the details, but you also see God has a flair for the dramatic. He just likes to just show you things. I mean, the, the, the different things you see in the, in the animal kingdom, the, the birds and the little dances some of them do, and the, and the, the, the things that animals do uh, just out of uh, instinct. You know, when um, monarchs um, migrate, they go down to Mexico in the winter. And I didn't realize this, but they, they just hibernate down there. 
And, the, and then in the spring, they fly up all over North America, up into Canada. Do you know that from the, the ones who leave Mexico to the ones who go back to Mexico, it's the fourth generation. The, the ones who leave Mexico uh, have babies in, on their way, and those babies go back to their place, and, and there's four generations between the ones you see in Mexico one year and the ones that are there the next year. How do they know where they came from and what to do? Don't lose your marvels. God's also at work in history. Not only world history, but my history, your history. There was a family that learned that uh, because they had a goal. They wanted to migrate. They wanted to live in America. There were nine kids in the family. And they decided they would save enough money for mom and dad and nine kids to all come together. And they scrimped and they worked and they saved and the kids got little jobs and they put money in the pot and finally they got enough money, they bought 11 tickets to sail to America. The week before the ship was to go, the youngest boy got bit by a dog. And the authorities, the health authorities said, uh, We've had cases of rabies. We need to quarantine you to make sure you don't get rabies and your family. And they missed the ship. They missed the boat. No refunds. The father was furious. He lit into that kid. What were you thinking? How can you be so stupid? Why did you let that happen? Blah, blah, blah. He was mad at God, saying the same stuff. Why did you let this happen? He was so angry. Uh, how would he ever get over it? He got over it in two seconds. He heard that the ship had sunk. Their tickets were for the Titanic. They would have been down in the poor section. They probably would have gone down with the ship. But God spared his whole family. And all of a sudden he was thankful. He hugged his son, he apologized. He knelt before God in hum humility. His whole perspective changed because he saw God was in that. Well, God's in everything, whether we see it or not. God's in everything, whether we like it or not. God has his hand in history. He has his hand in your life and mine. And we can be thankful for that. The second thing is a thankful heart rests in God's sovereignty. God's not only around for things happening, he's in charge and he makes things happen or he stops things from happening. The Bible says, O oh Lord God of our ancestors, you rule in heaven over all the nations of the world. You are powerful and mighty and no one can oppose you. Well, people can be against God, they can hate God, but they cannot stop God. They cannot prevent God from doing what he's gonna do. He is sovereign, he's in charge. And we think about this, your father is the one in charge of everything. Your father owns everything. You walk into a store, you can say to yourself, my dad owns this store. You sit down in a restaurant, my dad owns this place. You, you walk through the nature center, my dad not only owns it, he made it. You, when you, God is your father, you have somebody mighty in your life. And he rules over everything. He's in charge of everything. He cares for everything. And that brings us to the third thing. A thankful heart rejoices in God's goodness. Aren't you glad that the most powerful being in the universe is good? He's kind. He, he's, he's predictable in some ways. He's unpredictable in some, but not morally. What's good, he always calls good. What's evil, he always calls evil. When he says, I love you, he means it, and it's always true. You have a good, good father when you know the Lord. And he keeps his word, and he provides for our needs. He brings people into our lives and resources into our lives to show us that he cares. Does he make it easy? Not, not normally, not always, not too easy. He doesn't make softies out of us. He doesn't make self-centered brats out of us but he does care for us. The Bible says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His loving kindness lasts 
forever. I haven't counted how many times you'll find that verse in the Psalms, scattered from one Psalm to another, but it's there over and over and over. It's been a theme of worship for God's people for 3,000 years. God has a purpose for everything and he doesn't waste anything. He doesn't waste suffering. When you go through something painful, God won't waste it. He'll use it for good. I was listening to the scriptures this week and uh, the feeding of the 5,000. And remember after Jesus took five loaves and three fish, two fish, and he fed, fed five, I've got a correction guy right down here. <laughs> Fact check. Um, they picked up how many baskets of food afterwards? 12. One for each tribe of Israel, one for each disciple, one, wh whatever. But it was interesting to me, I thought about that, and I thought, now, the word I've, I've learned before, the word for the basket was the larger basket. They had little baskets and big baskets, but I don't know how big it was, five-gallon pail. But I thought, wait a minute, 12 baskets of food after 5,000 people ate. It took the scraps from 400 people to fill one basket. They, weren't just, they didn't just have food lying around. What that tells me is that Jesus was careful in what he did. He made enough for them to all eat what they wanted, and then he made sure there were some leftovers so everybody knew there really was enough. I had all I want, he had all he wants, and look, there's still food left. It showed God's generosity. But it also taught me this, thinking about it. God isn't just extravagantly wasteful. He measures what he does. And, um, and I know in my life, he's not wasted the good or the bad things if I'm cooperating with him. He has a purpose for everything. How many of God's gifts do you suppose we take for granted? I wake up, I feel good, I don't think much about it. My elbow hurts, I go, oh man. And when it feels better three days later, I say, thank you, Lord. Right? I didn't think to say thank you before. I told you the story about the guy who goes to the doctor. He says, Doc, you got to help me. My knee is just killing me. And the doc says, well, look, Fred, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but how old are you? I'm 92. Well, you're, you're 92. Don't you expect you're going to have some aches and pains? He says, well, Doc, my other knee's 92, and it don't hurt. We, we take it for granted sometimes, but God wants us to know that he accepts our gratitude for everything. And th the fact is, this is not about beating ourselves. Well, I should be more grateful. No, just be aware. Just be aware. And when you realize, I got something to be grateful for, express it. I think Thanksgiving Day is a wonderful idea. Splendid because it reminds us to stop and take a look. We're not only grateful for what God gives us, we're grateful for what he keeps away from us. Lita was in the house yesterday and she grabbed a bolt of material and she thought, that feels soft. She knew what the fabric was and she looked around and her hand was on a bat. <laughs> Fuzzy little guy. She texted me, she said, did you hear me when I screamed all the way over at the church? <laughs> and uh, so when I got home, I said, I'll take it outside. And I took it, and it wasn't there. So I moved it, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll check this bolt. And I picked up the next one. And I looked, of course, no bat. But when I put my hand, I thought, wait a minute. It had crawled under the first layer of, of uh, fabric and it was under there. And so we got him outside, it was all good. But what if he was poisonous? Do you, how many times do you suppose you've been within a foot of a spider? I read one time, you're never more than, I think it was either three or six feet, you're never more than three feet or six feet from a spider. So if you like spiders, cool. But how many of you could be dead right now? You've been in a car wreck, you fell out of a tree, you lipped off to a bigger guy, you slipped on the ice. 
How many of you could be dead a half dozen times easily? All of us. And that's the things we know about. How many times did we not know? We didn't know. I took this way home, and if I had taken that way, there was an icy spot. Whatever. Oh, man, God is good to us. He's so good to us. The things that didn't happen, good to us. A thankful heart realizes that. Number four, a thankful heart realizes that God's will is best. He's got a better idea than I do about anything I do. We come to trust him. And um, we may not have any idea what he's up to. We may not understand his will. But we know it's better than our plans. It's always better than ours. That family that missed the ride to America, they never forgot. God's plan was better than ours. And he does that. And so in the Psalms, uh, it says this, My God, I am happy to do whatever you want. When you realize his plan is good, you're happy to do his will. This woman was going to make Thanksgiving dinner. No big deal, except she'd never done it before. She'd always been with a relative, gone out to eat. She thought, I'm going to make a turkey. I'm going to make Thanksgiving dinner myself this year. She wasn't bold enough to invite anybody extra. It was just going to be her, her husband, and their son. But she was going to do it. But she was still nervous. And so when the meal was about ready, she called the guys and said, sit down. I'm going to bring in the turkey. And uh, listen, she said, when I bring it in and I take off the lid, the pan, don't you say a word if something's wrong. We'll just leave it, we'll get up, we'll go to a restaurant, okay? I don't want any comments if anything's wrong. And then she went in the kitchen to get it. When she came back, her loved ones were sitting at the table with their coats and gloves on. (laughs) Now, one thing you can be thankful, no one in your family would do something like that, right? Here's the point of the story. When we trust God, we assume the best. We assume the best about him. We don't understand him, but we know something about his heart. And we know he's good. And so we trust him. And we rely on him. And we give him thanks. And sometimes we don't even understand why it's going on, but we thank him. We assume the best and we thank him. Number five, the last one, a thankful heart responds to God's blessings. We say something to God. We show him. When a gift is given, it's a beautiful moment. Somebody thoughtfully did something for someone else. But the beauty of it is expanded and completed when the person says thank you. I knew someone who said that he, he, he bought a birthday present for his wife and he gave it to her. And three days later, it was still sitting on a chair, unwrapped. It was not a beautiful moment. It hadn't been received. And, it, if, and when a gift is received and, and it thanks is given, it kind of completes the circle. And that's how God intended it. And uh, in our relationships with him and with other people. And so uh, we respond. God told us, pray to me when you are in trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. One of the ways we honor him is to say thanks to him, to talk about him to others, to tell him what he did. There's a back and forth in every relationship. And God gives and we receive and we say thanks and that builds us. It, it repeats and we get a stronger connection until uh, it just expands and makes a big difference in our lives. God smiles with pleasure when we say thank you. He loves that. Our connection with him grows stronger and deeper when we express thanks. Think about Christmas morning. Here's this little fella, six years old, and uh, there's presents with his name on them. And he's opening them, and he's excited. Oh, I wanted one of these. And how do mom and dad feel? They're just, they're just soaking it in. They're, they're having a better time than he is, really. 
It just means so much to them. And it comes to a, just a point of completion when he, it's usually the daughter, but when he <laughs> stops and he gets up and he comes running over and he gives him a big old hug. And he says, thank you. You can't beat that. That's the highlight. That's what Christmas is on a human level, isn't it? And God feels that way. He, he, he doesn't quite get as much satisfaction when we tear into it and then say, is that all? <laughs> not quite the same feeling, not quite the same purpose, not really what he meant to happen. <clears throat> Gratitude is at the core of worship. Scripture says, let us show gratitude. Through this we offer worship in a manner pleasing to God. Worship is gratitude being expressed. And as we give thought to God's goodness and we respond the way he deserves and we realize anew how important he is to us, we bring something to our own hearts that's helpful and we bring something to his heart that is joy. Have you thought about giving God joy? Because we can he doesn't need anything. I got a nickel. He doesn't need it. But joy, he won't refuse that. And we bring him joy by thanking him. But with all the gifts he gives us, we still, being human, need to be intentional, make an intentional effort to maintain that spirit of gratitude. We need to pay attention let it sink in how generous he is, how faithful, how consistent. And we purposely focus on his faithfulness because otherwise we're just naturally distracted by anything that goes wrong. Uh, I, get, I go out to get in my car and somebody's car door has left a mark and that can kind of take over my thoughts for the whole afternoon or some other little thing. And so I have to purposely say, you know what? I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on this. And gratitude's a pretty good choice, isn't it? Do you know the English word thank and the English word think come from the same root? They go together. When I think, I realize how much I have to thank. And again, that's why Thanksgiving is so important. So important. Let's make sure we ask God to make us thankful. We do our best to be part of it. We work against the natural slowing down and, and mis, uh, misdirection that our minds can take and that we become intentionally grateful. Let's, in fact, not only be intentionally grateful, let's be exceptionally grateful. Like the three guys out of 18 who said, we're going to do something about this. They've done research on thankfulness. You know, at the universities, there's uh, been people who just worked on this. They, they did experiments. They did projects. They, they had students uh, write down three things that happened today at the end of the day for a month. Three things that happened today. They had other students uh, from the same group write down three things that went well today, three things I'm grateful for today. The ones who just thought about three things that happened had a whole different reaction uh, long term than the ones who said, here's three things I'm thankful for. You know that it's good for your brain. Your brain changes through good and bad experiences. And when you're thankful, you make your brain healthier. You sleep better if you're practicing gratitude. You have less physical pain. You have less inflammation. You have lower blood pressure. There's a whole list of healthy things that happen in your body that they can test for. When you are on a program of being thankful and showing it, writing it, or when you're not. Um, you, you have better relationships, of course. And uh, you're more resilient. You heal faster. There was something in the Daily Bread, I think this week, about a doctor who told somebody after surgery, now you write down things you're thankful for every day. 
and you'll heal, you'll heal better. They, do, they give people advice after these projects. One of them is to keep a notebook. So here's my gratitude journal. And uh, I started this years ago when I was going through just a deep, deep valley in my life. My personal life, my work life, everything was in a pit. I was depressed. And I started writing down things I was grateful for. And it helped me. And so uh, every year now, in November, for 10, 20 years, I don't know, I keep a little journal. I just write something I'm grateful for every day. And it's not a lot. Sometimes it's two or three lines. Sometimes it's a half a page. Um, but uh, just things. If you read it, you wouldn't say, that's not that profound. <laughs> it's not. It's just daily life. My shoestring broke when I was ready to leave for a wedding. And I had an extra pair in the drawer, same color. Thank the Lord. Just stuff. You wouldn't remember it a week later. But you look back and you say, you know, there's a pattern here. Yeah. So this year, being the bright guy I am, I didn't even remember to pull it out till the 10th of the month. So that's how, that's how natural it is to me after all these years. But I started on the 10th, and I've been writing something every day. And uh, you could do this. And they tell us at the university over there where they did the research that it'll be good for us. We'll be healthier. We'll be nicer. We'll enjoy our days more. If we just take a few minutes to think of something and say, I'm thankful for that. The same thing happens if you write a note to a person or if you just call them or send a text and say thank you. Someone uh, sent me a Facebook message a couple months ago. They had a picture of this big old tree and they said, we just want to thank you. You gave us a seedling 30 years ago. Well, I had bought a whole pack. You could get 25 in a bundle of just little tree shoots from the DNR. And I had planted them around my property. I had some extra. I took them to church, I guess, and said, anybody want them, take them. And this couple had taken one home and planted it up in East Bethel, Minnesota. And they sent me a picture 30-some years later and said, hey, thanks for that tree you gave us. This is what it looks like now. Well, that was kind of fun. And it was even more fun for them to send it. God has ways that he can give us to get good at a grateful spirit if we'll just make the effort. Don't you want to do that? And so the music team is going to come, but they're going to come slow this week because we're going to take 30, 60 seconds and just ask, uh, just ask ourselves, what can I thank God for right now? And so I'm going to invite you just to bow your heads as they get ready. Kathy will maybe play quietly for a minute. And uh, will you thank God for something that he brings to your mind right now?
Feels good, doesn't it, to thank God? Feels good to worship Him together. Thanks for being here. I had a book a guy wrote, A Year of Thanks. He decided he would write a thank you note every day to somebody. And of course, it was easy at first to think of people, his family, his co-workers, people in his life. But uh, as he got down there, he had to kind of think of who he was going to write to next. And of course, there were weeks where he wrote five in a row because he missed four days. And uh, that's life. But he, he kept it up. Pretty soon, he's thanking the mailman. Pretty soon, he's paying more attention to the people that come and go in his life. And he's thanking them. And uh, he said it changed him. People liked him better. He liked life better. His relationships improved. His spirit improved. He said it was great. It was good for me. And uh, the people that he wrote to, it was good for them. Some of them have never been thanked for the work they did. And so let's just ask God to make us intentionally grateful and exceptionally grateful. Can we do that? How about if we just say this, Lord, help me improve a little bit. Amen. Lord Jesus, here we are. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. You created us. You've spared our lives many times. You've kept us through thick and thin. You've provided for us. And now, Lord, here we are at this point in our lives and we want to say thank you, and we want to commit ourselves to being grateful people. Walk with us this week and this Thanksgiving week. Help us to make the effort to make Thanksgiving Day a day of thanks and to be kind to everyone involved in our lives. Flow through us to accomplish your purpose, we ask in your holy name. Amen. God bless you. A thousand armies come marching, shall never 